What's up, everybody? It's Soren Baker here on The Soren Baker Show. Thank you for tuning in to Unique Access, for listening on the Digital Soapbox Network, for liking, subscribing, downloading, and sharing the podcast. We appreciate the support. And as you've been able to tell here, we've been bringing in a lot of great guests from a wide range of backgrounds. Obviously, most of them rap, but as we expand the show and start doing other things, we're bringing in other guests that have contributed a lot of other great things to the world, and one of them is joining us tonight. So, without further ado, we're going to bring in our special guest for tonight, the legendary Tony Basil. Thank you for coming through. Thank you, Soren. And let's introduce you a little bit so for people that may know some of your work. Um, she's been integral in the hip-hop culture with her work with the Lockers, and then for those who uh, know Run DMC, you might have heard a song called It's Tricky, which I would say was inspired by her big song, Ricky. Nikki. Uh, Ni- hey, Nikki. Hey, Nikki. Hey, you're Nikki. so fine. We could yes. go, hey, Soren, you're so fine. Yes. But it didn't rhyme with Kitty. I just said it wrong. I know. It's okay. With my apologies. But that song. Uh, it was an anthem. That was inspired by, or that inspired Run DMC. And that's... Uh, one of the many, many things, and then she also choreographed the forthcoming Quentin Tarantino film that's getting a lot of uh, acclaim once upon a time in Hollywood. So she's been uh, in the game a long time and has a phenomenal history and track record, and that's why she's joining us today. So thank you for coming through. Thank you. So with the Run EMC, and of course, the song I heard 7,000 times now that I said the title wrong, I'm a little embarrassed, but that being said, when you heard the Run EMC song, do you remember the first time hearing it and what you were thinking at the time? It, I just felt that, you know, at the time the song came out, it was a huge hit, but it was considered kid stuff. Okay. So when that happened, I went, you know what, this kind of um, gives me some clout, gives me some weight. I really liked it. Mm -hmm. Um, I liked it also when Avril Lavigne closed her show, uh, one of her tours, sat up on the drums and sang Mickey and had cheerleaders come out. And, you know, the Rolling Stones said, wow, who would have thought Tony Basil's Mickey would be (laughs) an anthem and set a precedent, you know, because at the time nobody really knew what it was. Well, I think also with the the Mickey video, speaking of uh, percussion, you were actually used as a percussion instrument in the video. <laughs> yeah, kind of. <laughs> kind of. The drums were being played on various parts of your anatomy, if I recall. Correctly. Oh, you know what video that is? That's with Shabadoo yeah. and Spaz Attack. That was the video we did for my BBC special in mm-hmm. the UK. Right. But the other video, the other promotional the, video, the, the MTV, one. was the More, cheerleader right. one. Yeah. Well, I liked both videos. Thank you. But I wasn't used to seeing you uh, as a drum or (laughs) whatever that was. You know, I never took myself that seriously. Okay? It was like, you know, this is all fabulous and entertainment. I came from a show business family. My father was an orchestra leader. My mother's side of the family were vaudevillians with the craziest act you can ever imagine. You know, at three years old, I'm standing in the wings looking at my father be the orchestra leader. And my, my mom and her family do these crazy tricks like my aunt would wrap her leg around her neck and hop around and the other, the other sisters would do backflips. And my mom did a boxing dance Mm -hmm. with her brother and my uncle painted a face on his stomach, put a hat over his head and rolled his stomach and whistled. Now, (laughs) anything after that, you know, it's like... So growing up with that type of background, (laughs) when you start to... Granted, you've been around show business, sounds like your whole life, but when you start being around children or people your age that weren't in show business and you started understanding that that wasn't maybe standard or normal what was that interaction for you like as a kid yeah i knew it was special 
Okay. When my mom and I would walk down the alley of the Chicago Theater mm-hmm. in the 50s, and there were all these autograph seekers, you know, holding these little things for people to sign when they came out of the stage door, and we would walk up, and they would part for us to walk through, like Moses <laughs> and the water. <laughs> right. And I knew it was special. I always knew it was special. We'd walk up to the third floor to my dad's dressing room. The second floor had the star. And across to the other side of the stage had the opening acts, which were the jugglers, the tap dancers, the comics. Hmm. And I just knew it was so special. You know, I went to ballet class every day of my life and was always in the theater and was always focused on that. And I I don't know how people get into show business that weren't born into it. It, Mm -hmm. It's got to be such a huge leap. But for me, it was just, you know, it was the journey. That's what you were doing. That's what, yeah. And and one of the things that... uh, very impressive among so many of your accolades and accomplishments of which there are dozens. One of the things that I thought was interesting is how you were able to become a legitimate choreographer so at such a young age for big entertainers, big productions, big films, big tours. So in addition to being a dancer on your own. So what was it about you that made you say, you know what, I could be a choreographer. I don't only have to be the quote-unquote talent. I can orchestrate the talent. Well, in the mid-60s, when go-go dancing became very popular, jazz dancing like on Carol Burnett and some of those shows was the route that, you know, production on television was going Movies was going in a direction of the AIP films with the, um, you know, all all the bathing suit girls, go-go dancing, Frankie and, you know, Frankie and Annette Funicello. They had all these films and they needed choreographers that understood that which I guess could now be called street which was go-go dancing, the girls in the cages, the fringe, the pony, the skate, all these great dances that there were songs named after, right. um, and yet were trained, knew how to count, understood the business. And there was very few of us. Hmm. And um, I, I came across a guy, David Winters, who was one of the greatest greatest dancers of all time and very young choreographer, we started to choreograph. I became his assistant and we started to choreograph shows like Shindig, The Tammy Show, where I first saw James Brown, and Viva Las Vegas with Elvis Presley and Anne Margaret. So I was his assistant and he used to feature me in all, all these like movies. And when he moved to New York to do Hullabaloo, I was supposed to meet him there. And I started to get calls. David was out of town. There was no one to take over what he was doing out here in Los Angeles. So I choreographed a film uh, called The Cool Ones. Mm -hmm. And that really started my career as a choreographer. But at the same time, I was also an actress in Easy Rider and Five Easy Pieces, the exact same time period. Right. And it wasn't long after that that I saw Don Campbell fly through the side door of Osco's. My jaw dropped. I had heard about him. This is a year before Soul Train. Okay. I was hearing about him, that there was this new dance he was doing. And at this point, you were living in Los Angeles. Oh yeah, okay. I was. I I was. I moved here in in the mid '60s. Okay. And before we get to Mr. Campbell, one thing I wanted to, since you referenced them, and you saw them, and a lot of people, you know, that are listening here probably didn't get the the benefit of being able to see James Brown in person or Elvis in person. So for you. What made each one of them electric and phenomenons 
in their own worlds? Why for each one? Well, before before I worked with Elvis, I had seen Elvis on the Ed Sullivan show on on television. Of course, they would shoot him from the waist up because they thought he was so lascivious right. nowadays. But so Elvis at the time uh, that that his films were happening, that same time period, the Beatles and the Rolling Stones were arriving in town. Right. So there was these... Elvis was doing films using music of iconic um, uh, music producers like Georgie Stoll. But Georgie Stoll had done the old American musicals. And the Stones and the Beatles were coming in with a new kind of music. So when I got to work with Elvis and Anne, it was really like working on a film. Okay. They were fabulous. It was fun. We were choreographing go-go. Okay. Um, but James Brown, when I saw him, I had been winning dance contests on the Sunset Strip, twist contests and go-go contests. And when I saw James Brown, I realized I had no idea what I was doing when it came to what we now call street. Mm-hmm. It was, look, we all saw him together. The Stones was the first time they had seen him live. We were, this is at the Tammy show. We were all in the green room okay. watching on this TV what was happening. Right. And he started to do this step that I'd never seen before. Of course, now I realized it came from the mashed potatoes, but he took that mashed potatoes and twisted it and turned it upside down uh, and, and, and took Street to a place that was deep art. Not just that, but the band, mm-hmm. the flames. Mm-hmm. Y- you would see that they weren't taking their eyes off of him, that he was actually making the chart and the orchestration live because he would stop when he felt like it, when he felt the feeling, the flames would keep their eye on him, bam, they would stop, freeze, then they'd start again. It was so exciting. And then when he went into, please, 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 Mm -hmm. and he dropped to his knees and they put that, that cape around him that's like Shakespearean. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was, I know it sounds dramatic, but it was dramatic and it was like Shakespeare. He brought a whole theatrical show in a style that I didn't know could exist except in the old days when the Ziegfeld Follies in New York would do these huge shows with these famous, famous people. Uh, people on Broadway with, you know, all these dancers. I hadn't ever seen anything like it. It changed my dancing. It changed everything. It changed everything for me. I could even see that the next film that I danced in was um, uh, Village of the Giants. I can see that I did a solo, and I could see my dance style radically changed. I was trying to do that little step James Brown was doing. I was kind of doing the old jazz, but the new little step, and a split, and I came up. And I thought, I mean, it was a feeble attempt, Mm -hmm. but it radically changed. It radically changed me and everybody in that room, because I remember the stones standing there thinking, oh, my God. We've got to follow this guy because that's how the show was set up, that they followed James. Mm. And Andrew Oldham, who was their manager at the time, was smart enough to let a good 20 minutes pass before the Stones a little downtime. <laughs> set up. There was some sound problems, Andrew said, and it 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 it. It, it, it gave time for everyone to kind of like... Catch their but, breath. But I remember David Winters and myself thought, this is going to be a bloodletting. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. How is, how is this guy, how are these English, these four English guys going to follow what we just saw? So 
we went, we sat. That's Santa Monica Civic. That's a very wide stage. Mm-hmm. We sat on the side of the stage with my legs dangling off, waiting for this bloodletting. Let me tell you, Mick Jagger jumped up in the air with this tambourine doing a Bo Diddley song. And there wasn't a girl in the audience that didn't forget about James Brown <laughs> and see Mick Jagger. And of course, weren't we seeing two of the greatest pop entertainers and performers of our time, James Brown and the Rolling Stones, right. back to back. And they were fabulous. Uh, I remember Brian Jones, when, when Mick jumped up in the air, Brian turned his back to the audience. And me, coming from, you know, vaudeville, my parents, you would never turn your back to the audience. Right. But there was something so dramatic about that. There was just something so crazy about the way Mick kind of moved down the runway with this strange little pigeon-toed crazy dance he was doing hmm. after James's dance, but it all... Is that all, where you got Mickey from? <laughs> it all worked. Well, you know what? No, well, well, you know, if anybody should be tributed to that song, it would be Mr. Jagger, okay. I must say. Well, now it all makes sense. Now does it all make sense? <laughs> because uh, I did uh, hang out with the, the Stones for the next week and a half. Because Jack Nietzsche, who uh, put that show together, um, mm. was very good friends with them and with myself. So, yeah, they drived in my DeSoto. Okay. <laughs> nice. That we had to push up a hill. Mm. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah, the engines weren't quite the same. Well, and the hills and the, yeah, but anyway. So, as we get into the locking aspect <clears throat> of your career with the lockers, when you <clears throat> were discovering that movement, had you been familiar with b-boying and breakdancing in New York at all? It hadn't happened yet. Okay. It hadn't happened yet. Okay. I mean, there was lots of stuff happening in New York, but the actual scratching and the b-boy and Cool Herc and all that really hadn't happened yet. Neither had Soul Train. Right. Happened yet. Um, it was the end of... I was in con promoting uh, um, Easy Rider. Okay. So when I came back to Sunset Strip, where I could always find dance... So that's 69-ish? Yeah, in the end, of, in so, the end yeah. Okay. I couldn't find any street. I would take my ballet classes at 11.30 in the morning, but... And then find some club at night. Okay. I couldn't find any street uptown. Mm-hmm. So I asked a girlfriend uh, who was still dancing on um, maybe Rick D's Hollywood, uh, Go Go, one of those TV shows, find me a really good, the best kid dancer that, that, that comes and hangs out. And she found me this guy named Lamont Peterson, who I contacted. He had no idea what I meant by give me a class and catch me up. Okay. But he finally figured it out. Well, what I'm, did he interpret it as? Uh, well, when, he, when, we, 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 when we met up on Adams, in a, in a little theater on Adams Boulevard, and he started teaching me the runaway and the bump. Okay. The funky chicken was kind of old by then. It was just, you know... Dances changed quickly during that time period, really mm-hmm. quickly, because they changed with whatever song was being sung. Funky Chicken, uh, The Breakdown, that kind of thing. And Lamont was gay, became a famous dancer on Soul Train. And he said, you know, there's this guy, Don Campbell, and he's creating a dance called The Campbell Lock. And you might be really interested mm. in checking this dance out. Lamont was gay. He went to different clubs. He said, so we're going to have to go to some other clubs to look for him. And I lived in Topanga Canyon. I would pick him up somewhere around Crenshaw area, and we'd go to these clubs. And for those that don't know, that is quite a hike. (laughs) It's not exactly (laughs) next door. Yes, Uh, especially at 1130 at night, because you can't go to those clubs any earlier than that. And uh, we went kind of looking for Don Campbell. And it took a while 
Okay. Because if you don't know, if you don't go to the right club on the right night at the right time, you miss everything. Right. And uh, one day at Osco's, where we were up, Osco's was where La Cienica and San Vicente crisscross now. Okay. Actually, thank God it's Friday was eventually shot there. Nice. Um, he flew in the side door. Obviously not coming through the front because he didn't want to pay. He came in with two other guys, all with striped socks and knickers on. To this day, Don cannot remember who it was. I thought it was Fred Berry. Okay. But maybe it was this guy, Johnny McLeod, another famous name in street dance that disappeared before we formed the lockers. Um, And Lamont turned to me and said he didn't need to. But he said, that's Don Campbell. But I, I, knew. I knew it had to be because I had never, it was like seeing, it was like the shock of James Brown because it mm. was the strangest, most exciting dance. And it was not a partner dance. It wasn't a, the dance that you do when you go, it was a performance dance. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly what it was. Um and eventually, it was about maybe a half a year before, uh, Soul Train, Lamont called me and set, in Topanga Canyon and said, you know, we're all down at Soul Train and we all go to this club called the Citadel because it was actually down the street on Sunset Boulevard. And uh, he said, you should meet us there. And that was the beginning of seeing this incredible these incredible clubs and dance that I never wanted to be from never this was it you know there was a there was a a fight on the dance floor and I said to Lamont what are they fighting about and he said dance space and I went this is where I want to be (laughs) (laughs) I want to be where they're fighting about dance space where they're not hugging at their tights, hanging at the bar at 11.30 in the morning. I wanted to be 11.30 at night down in those clubs. And it was the beginning of a journey that still continues to this day for me. Yeah, definitely. And something I'm intrigued about is given that you did have a ballet background and you had all these you know, films you had done, TV shows. and Yeah, I had done a lot of films by then, Uh uh-huh. What was it, why do you think you were open to what you were seeing in the sense that this was some underground club, it wasn't, you know, some big production or anything? Because it was art. Okay. Because it was art. Because these dancers, because I could go to a ballet and see Brezhnikov do a solo, Mm -hmm. and I could go down to the Citadel and see Don Campbell improvise and it was of equal value and as difficult and guess what the music was better (laughs) i concur yeah yeah so as you're getting into that the world of what then i guess uh the campbell lock became the lock or with the lockers etc what did you notice about what was happening musically in Los Angeles in particular that enabled the dance and the dancing of what uh, the Campbell Lock became? What enabled it to flourish in the way that it did? Well, it was a a, a theatrical dance. It mm-hmm. wasn't a partner dance. And it... So you're saying it was perfect for show. It was. It was a show dance. It was... Uh, communication Um, it all you know all the dances previous the go-go you know everybody was holding hands until go-go go-go footwork started to happen that you couldn't do when you were close up tight but Don not being a footwork guy really started to create a lot of arm arm moves arm moves that and, and theatricality. In other words, to this day, when we judge dance contests and I go, God, these guys are really pretty close. Who would you say? He goes, who's the best performer? That was part of the layer of 
what the lockers became. It that dance attracted great performers. Mm-hmm. That look, I mean, if you think about it, that group had Fred Berry in it, who became an enormous rerun. television star rerun on For what's happening to those that don't know that's who that is and Shabadoo was in that group who became a matinee idol with breaking an electric boogaloo breaking and breaking too you know um <clears throat> you know that that group was cast unbelievable uh and what happened was is, and they had a female that did pretty well for herself too Thank you. <laughs> yeah, they, they had a babe Can't in the group. Her name. They had a babe in the group. Uh, um, but the moment we were on television, we got an agent. We got, I mean, everything happened because it was like nobody had seen anything like us before. And what, we're, what we really were were a remake in, in an odd way of my mother's vaudeville act Hmm. because they were an opening act and we were an opening act right we would open up for cheech and chong we would open up for uh bill cosby we opened up for in reno at tahoe Mm -hmm. we were this opening act that could open up for the funkadelics at radio city music hall in the same year we opened up at carnegie hall for frank sinatra so what what was it, Frank Sinatra, for instance, what was it with his team or himself that you know, how did that work in the sense that those audience demographics seem to be polar opposites? Well, Frank Sinatra loved dance, and he came from that stage show circuit also mm-hmm. that my father played in, where there was the opening dance act, there was a comic, and then there was the star. And that's what that's how he ran his tours. Mm-hmm. And well, we were the hottest dance act <laughs> ever, you know, um, that was happening at the time. So we we just never stopped working. So today, as you're well aware, <clears throat> especially in the you know, I'm most familiar with rap, but in the rap world, the urban music world in particular, you know, it's evolved into a way where you see basically whoever the main artist is and then artists that sound like them or affiliated with them there's not the oh we have a comic we have a dance group and Mm -hmm. we have a sing we have a a Mm -hmm. musician Mm -hmm. because it doesn't exist so but it could but why it could why do you think that went away why do you think it's now so focused so hyper specific well i think managers are um promoting people that can make them money. Dance does not make money. Dance does not have a hit record. But wait, if dance doesn't make money, how and why did you get booked? And how? Well, why because that successful? was still television. Okay. We did. We did Johnny Carson. We did Carol Burnett. We did the, the Vegas circuit. Um, as I said, we opened up for Bill Cosby. Now you know there's resident acts like J Lo in right. Vegas. It's just different things things evolve and change and it, it, there could be there's uh you know I mean look Nigel Lithgow tours so you think you can dance people they tour right. they probably could do something where they opened up in Vegas Derek Huff certainly could open up in Vegas for somebody um you know uh Look, dance went away, but dance is happening on television again. If you think about So You Think You Can Dance, Dancing with the Stars, mm-hmm. J-Lo's TV show, dance is happening. It's just happening in a different way. And it's great because it's happening uh, like the lockers without dancing behind a singer. Right. As the marquee act. Yes, as the act. I'm just surprised there's not, there's, there's shows like The Voice, there's the new show of How Can You Write a Hit Song, um, American Idol, there's singing shows, and then there's the dancing shows, but there's no competition of All right, Tony, where's... we just discovered what we're going to do, a sh- we got to do a show about that. Where's, where's, <laughs> where's the next Janet? Where's the next Madonna? Mm-hmm. Where's that... 
that performer... Tina Turner. Where's the Tina Turner? Where's that performer that can sing and dance? Mm-hmm. You know, right now, there's a, it's very separated on television. But look, I'm really happy that all those dancers are working. Yeah. So in Los Angeles at this time, obviously, it took a little while. But once rap came in and locking then became part of the hip-hop culture on the West Coast. What what was going on in your mind as far as how the evolution of locking and the evolution of, you know, the, the people that were kind of going in hand in step with that, the, I guess, would be the Uncle James Army, the Egyptian lovers, all that type of stuff. All that great stuff. Well, before that, you know, there was still changeover in dance styles because mm-hmm. mid, the lockers were uh, on television 1973 and really prominent through mm, like 77, 78. But during that time period in the clubs... Popping was starting to happen. Mm-hmm. Electric Boogaloo's came down from Fresno. Right. Uh, and the popping clubs were happening. And when that was happening, even though the lockers were still riding high on TV, you didn't lock anymore in the clubs. Mm-hmm. You had to pop in the clubs. And why do you... Th- I know there's the general evolution, but what did you notice about the practitioners? Some when- music. Okay. The music changes everything. Actually, music changes everything. The shoes change everything. You hmm. know, the lockers danced in what we called marshmallows, which were almost platform, like the whackers okay. danced in platforms at that time period. Hard shoes. You didn't go up on the balls of your feet. It dictated a different cost, a certain style of dance, of certain kind of steps. That's my problem. I've always had the wrong shoes. The wrong shoes. <laughs> I bring three pairs. Um, when hush puppies came in, okay, you could go on the ball of your foot, and Boogaloo Sam started to roll on the balls of his feet, and create a dance called the Electric Boogaloo. Mm-hmm. And then popping was happening in Northern California. And all these waving and these ticking and these styles started to merge. And that's what started to happen. And lordy, lordy, zap happened. Okay. With those hard, choo, choo, where everybody would pop to that hard zap beat. Right. And the dance styles change in the same way that you know, dance styles changed when rap and hip hop came in. And that, of course, was very New York driven. Mm-hmm. So we actually kind of hung behind the scene with the poppers when breaking was really starting to happen in New York and hip hop and that culture, I mean, totally blew up. So- and then we got music videos. Right. So those dancers danced behind the rap acts. I mean, rap acts used to bring dancers as part of their scene, Yeah. you know, as part of their performance. So there was a changeover. When, when I started to do, I, got a, I started to do shows, my own shows in the late 70s. I started singing again, uh, mixing ballet and street And songs, because in that same time period of working with the Lockers, I was choreographing and directing shows with David Bowie, Mm -hmm. Tina Turner, and Bette Midler. So I, you know, I was getting information from the best of the best. I mean, if I can't come out being good and talented, if I didn't start out talented, Osmosisly. Shame on me yes. if I, you know, didn't learn something from all these people. So I started to do my own shows. And actually the first one I did was songs I'd choreograph for other people and always wanted to do myself at the Roxy. And uh, I had a lot of dancers, a live band, and uh, that took me on a journey... That was in 77, and by 1979, uh, I started to record three Devo tunes, three promotional videos that turned into an album that Mickey was on. Mm -hmm. And I tell you something. 
when I was, when we were opening up for the Cheech and Chong at the Roxy, I remember Greg, we used to close our act silent with just chanting, good God. We used to, he used to call out, double up, make it fancy, good God. And I remember, I can, I can remember it as clear as day going, this is a record. But rap hadn't happened yet. I didn't know. The only thing I could relate it to was cheerleading because I had been a cheerleader all my life. I love mm-hmm. cheerleading. So when it came time for me to do a record, it was just natural for me to start thinking, hmm, what about that? What about that kind of percussion? What did that sound like in the, in the basketball court? It was fantastic when people used to chant. And you remember, if you look back at those 60s songs with Shirley Ellis doing the clapping song Mm -hmm. or the name game, those songs were fantastic. So that's what, that's what kind of, all that information led me to Mickey. And then how were you navigating uh, being a choreographer, an actor, a singer, a dancer, how how did you balance, or how did that, how did you navigate all those different worlds at the same time? Well, I just did. Um, when I was working for Bowie, and we were putting together the Diamond Dogs tour in '73, I would fly back and forth uh, and do Disneyland with the lockers, and you know, go back and forth. Um, It was, God gave me just good timing. The timing, in some respects, I might have been a little ahead of my time. Mm -hmm. Uh, But creatively, it it was really extraordinary. Um, David Bowie and Iggy Pop, if I can drop two names, uh, were in L.A. I was supposed to be doing, after my first show at the Roxy, I got a pilot, television pilot, um, which sold. And then I was going to have Iggy Pop, David on it. It was going to be like those old Carol Burnett shows, but with all these other people. And then that fell apart because the network, they just had no vision. Okay. And David and Iggy said... I said, what's, what's happening in music? And they said, well, you know, everybody sends us cassettes. These were little cassettes at the time. There's only one group we heard that we loved that sent us a cassette from Ohio, and they're called Devo. Hmm. And they're going to be at the Starwood. We should go see them. And oh, my God, <laughs> you know, it, it was again, again. <laughs> one of those nights where... We're sitting in the balcony, and are they doing punk or opera? What are these guys doing? What is their vision? I mean, they like, like James, like Don, like came out of nowhere with their own thing. And of course, everybody at that time imitated them after that. But there were some really, you know, great, great groups that 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 did c- come out of that era. I mean, the punk scene was loud and in some respects too crazy, very, you know, they were all killing themselves with drugs. Um, But uh, there were some people like Rock Lobster, that song, and The Cars and Devo that really some great, great, great music came out of, and great performers, Mm -hmm. great performers. So as this was happening, rap was beginning its ascension. Uh huh. So what do you remember? Some of the, some of your contemporaries. What were their feelings about rap? What do you mean? Did they? You mean like David or Bat? Yeah. Did they listen to it? Well, let me tell you. Nineteen ninety nine. Nineteen ninety nine. I remember okay. being at the Palladium, okay. Sunset Boulevard. I heard Bernadette Cooper mm-hmm. sing. I look good. Okay. And I wrote that. There still wasn't, you know, cell phones. So I had to write it down because I knew that was a song for Bette Midler. Hmm. And I knew I was going to be choreographing and co-directing her next show. And she opened up her show 
with I Look Good, Bernadette rewrote the lyrics for her, and okay. she did this fabulous rap that was very funny about how good she looked. And it brought down the house. So all of this, it crosses over. It, it just all, it all, for me, it all crossed over. And I could bring information um, from one side of the tracks to the other side of the track and vice versa. You know, everybody, everybody was schooling me. Every, every, I mean, one hand washed the other. Except if I understood correctly from other stuff we have been talking about. Gangster rap. Gangster rap. So what well, happened? No, well, what happened know, with we all love, rap? Look, we all love gangster rap. I just remember I was telling my friend the other day when we were talking about doing your show. Um, well, I was coming out of the Palladium at the time, and it was windy, and there were a lot of flyers on the ground. And somebody said, Tony, your name's on this flyer. And I looked down, and I picked up this flyer, and it said... Boogaloo Shrimp and Tony Basil will be judging a dance competition. And I saw names of guys from NWA. Hmm. And I went, well, nobody's called me, but I'm showing up. Okay. You know? <laughs> so that was the beginning of previous to that time. Our dance clubs were mostly records, but every now and then rappers would come and do a live show. Okay. And when gangster rap started coming in, um, the mood changed because the clientele changed. Okay. And it was a clientele that was dressed in a way that it didn't fit the attire that was written on a list outside the door of what you had to would be wearing. And if you weren't wearing, and if you were wearing... And they did not meet the, the, the attire list. And there was problems, but I mean big problems right. outside of these clubs. I crawled under cars. Yeah, there were a lot of shootouts. Yes. Stabbings. Yes. Et cetera. Yes. Riots. And, <laughs> yes. And this happened simultaneously, Philly, New York, because I know the dancers were saying the clubs, because the promoters of the dance clubs that were also inviting these acts to perform live, and there was all these problems, the, 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 the clubs and the theaters stopped letting the promoters book. Hmm. And a lot of our clubs closed down. Um, there was not a lot of places to dance. There was a place that Prince opened up in downtown L.A. I forgot the name like, of it. Glam Slam? Glam yeah. Slam. Yeah. That, <clears throat> that became very popular. But I remember somebody getting on stage one night and saying, Bulia Tribe. I mean, I can't even say what he said. He said, suck my... Well, we all looked at each other we hit the floor because we knew if Bulia tribe was in the house, there was just going to be a problem. Crazy problems. Right. So this started to happen and happen and happen and happen. Um, and guess what? What also started to happen was dance studios started to teach hip hop. Hmm. You know, previous to that time period, you couldn't get a locking class. There was no such thing. You couldn't get a popping class. Alfonso Rivera was selling linoleum, though. No, <laughs> yeah, not, the, there was no such thing. Right. And all of a sudden, because of videos and the mothers seeing dancers on videos, they, the kids wanted to dance like the people in the videos. Right. So the first things that started to happen at these big dance studios was you would see video choreography taught. And they would teach a routine from some popular popular video. And that started to happen. And then Janet, you know, with her phenomenal music and that choreography, that Anthony Thomas with um, what he did with her with her with her stuff mixing you know he 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 made he made a dance in rhythm nation mm-hmm. that was a 
an amalgamation of locking, popping, and hip hop, and really made it his own. And uh, the change was happening. Madonna, the change was happening. Even um, Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson, yeah, the change was happening. Um, so everything changes, you know? And if you can ride the wave, if you can ride the wave and you stick with it and you embrace the change, there's nothing better. It's when you negate the change and you say, that's not good, that's not happening, because it really, it threatens you. Um, that's when you're in trouble. And I've, I've just always loved everything new that ever happened, you know, and I, I've embraced it. Sometimes I can't do the dance, but I sure as hell will know the dancers that are great and make sure they work. And speaking of work, you have the new Quentin Tarantino film that's about to be coming out, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, that you choreographed. So It's not a musical, needless to say. Needless to say. Well, I, I would, from the trailer, I definitely didn't <laughs> I think it was a I must say, <laughs> he put a lot of movement in that trailer. I was thrilled. Yeah. Um, and it was like full circle for me because it takes place in the 60s. Mm-hmm. And I started dancing in Hollywood in the 60s. Right. And he closed down a five blocks on Hollywood Boulevard to shoot at Musso and Frank's. And in the 60s, I lived up that street on Sycamore, and I walked through those five blocks to go to base camp. And he had dressed all the windows in the style of the 60s. Oh, my God was like an acid trip for me (laughs) it was so every moment of working with these people and working on the film was absolutely fantastic um and i knew sharon tate and i knew roman Mm -hmm. and i actually went out with jay sebring who was one of the people that was murdered up at the house that that night that manson people murdered Mm -hmm. so This film for me was, it was something else. It was, it was something else. It was, I mean, it almost, I almost tear up at it because, you know, there were days where people looked exactly like the people I hung out with in the 60s, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I really, really got to relive it and work with obviously the most incredible actors of our time, needless to say, one of the greatest directors of our time, Quentin Tarantino, who, by the way, loves making movies. Mm -hmm. He loves making movies. So if you can keep up with him and you can deliver, this is a joyous event. And it it really was for me. It was was fantastic. You know, I, I wasn't there to to really do musical numbers, although we did do some musical stuff, turns out, because he would become inspired and go, let's do this, let's do that. You know, most of it was to make sure that the people at the parties were not dancing hip-hop, that the extras weren't dancing (laughs) hip-hop, that they were dancing the pony, the skate, and the twist, you know? And that's that's very important, um, you know, for things to look authentic in that kind of film. Right. And... Did you, so they gave you a lot of, I guess, latitude per They se? gave me latitude because I was the one who knew that stuff. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure I'm one of the few people that are still alive that are even dancing that style, you know, that can dance that style, that lived it, that, uh, you know, but I tell you something, Mr. Tarantino, uh, when it came to the names of some of the dancers, Mm-hmm. In in the in the in the beach films and the dancers on the Hullabaloo show, he knew the names of the dancers. Of course, those dancers at that time were like Terry Garr, who mm-hmm. became a movie star. They were Donna McKechnie, who won several Tonys on Broadway. Michael Bennett, who created Chorus Line, was a dancer on Hullabaloo. So these dancers. Um, became very famous people. But Quentin has a photographic memory, and he just, 
I mean, he stood up one day and and I don't know, we were talking about dance styles and I said something about the Freddy because I didn't use the Freddy very much. And he said, oh, the Freddy. And he jumped up and he did the Freddy. So I thought, "Mm, I got to know my stuff. (laughs) I got to know my stuff with this man. Gotcha. And then now working on and this and being in in film so long granted everything has evolved and everything is different but what do you see of how films are put together on the dance side well this walk through this film was like being in the 60s you know there were the (laughs) the ad's the cater it was the same in mm-hmm. a way it was just and of course it took place in the 60s so it was very much the same you know action clapboard right um getting up at five in the morning um but there are dance movies now like like serve and you know there's a there's a lot of dance movies i think i think the big thing with dance is all these award shows where you know rihanna use them they use a million dancers i mean so many dancers in this city work during those award shows oh my god you know so dance changes but it keeps finding its place but still it's not a money maker it's it's a journey for a person that is in lust with dance that they cannot stop dancing like a kid that can't stop rapping or a kid that can't stop singing or somebody that doesn't want to put down a camera it's just the dance is not one of those art forms like poetry that, you know, that you can, um, you know, build a house in Beverly Hills. <laughs> I mean, I just know kids that are living, you know, five, five kids in one house here taking class at Millennium and Edge and auditioning. And uh, there's a an event once a month called Carnival that Carrie, my good friends Carrie and Paulette put on. And I went to Carnival last week, and there were over 200 dancers. Mm -hmm. 200 dancers in this event. I just... There's there's not 200 jobs. There's barely, barely a couple of video jobs. If you... Oh, my God, if you can be part of, you know, J-Lo's crew or be part of Madonna's tour or be working with, you know, choreographers that are doing these resident shows. But how many dancers are there? You know, 8 to 12? I mean, when we did, when Bette did her Vegas residency, The Showgirl Must Go On, we had 19 showgirls. Okay. 18 showgirls. Four singing and dancing harlots and bat. So, you know, but that's still just 18. It's not the 200 people that were, you know, dancing for free the other night, showing what they could do. So how do you think that can change? It's not going to change. Why not? Well, because there's never, there's, there's not enough, there's never enough jobs. There's not enough jobs. There's not enough jobs for the choreographers you know, there's only a certain amount of of jobs available, and there's more dancers. Okay, how many rappers are going to become famous? How many rappers are going to be able right. to pay the rent? You know, I mean, th- that's that's think. just a dr- that's <laughs> just a you know a needle in a haystack. I think that's how many directors are going to become famous. It's, it's so you're just saying it's analogous to what else is going on in entertainment. Sure. Nothing. Sure. It's not dance per se. Sure. It's just I grew up, you know, my dad was a resident orchestra leader. He was the orchestra leader for years at the Chicago Theater. Then he was moved by the mob when stage shows closed down because his name was Luigi Basilotta <laughs> um, to Vegas. Okay. Where he was the resident orchestra there was leader. No mob in Vegas. Was well, it? <laughs> where he was the resident orchestra leader at the Sahara Hotel to the day he died. So I grew up in show business. He wasn't a star, but he was a fantastic orchestra leader, and he had a regular job every day. And as a musician, that's almost impossible to this day. Uh, he didn't have to tour. He was home. Dad and mom were home 
And I just stood on the side of the stage. And I was a lucky, lucky girl. I've had a fabulous and continue, you know, I continue to have surprises like Quentin calling me and saying, hey, you want to choreograph my film? Well, yeah, Quentin. Yeah. But that's why when you said that, I was curious because clearly you're at the upper echelon of what you've done. And, you know, I just believe that everything in the world of art is going to be a challenge to be successful because of the competition because of so many people wanting to do it but that there you know there are opportunities there it's just extremely there are opportunities difficult. there are opportunities but you have to be prepared when they come along and you have to be able to deliver i got to tell you still to this day as in the 60s be prepared and I can't tell you how many times I have prepared deeply for auditions, whether it was dancing or whether it was for choreographing a film or to work with an artist that I did this enormous amount of work, looking back, figuring out what they do, you know, and maybe I didn't get the job. But to be prepared and to be prepared to lose the job, but also if you get the job, to be prepared to deliver and keep the job. And keep the job. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, there it is, y'all. <laughs> Tony Basil is in the building. And I know also you have been uh, very active on social media. Uh, I am. So, Who would have thought? I would have thought at, you know, my age that social media would have left me behind. But I guess when they see my dancing next to my age... Those things go viral. So, uh, so yeah. How do so people sh find you in case they're interested? Um, I guess on my Facebook and I don't even, uh, you know, Instagram and tweet. And uh, actually, I'm doing a workshop in mm -hmm. uh, for at Edge Performing Arts on the 23rd. It's going to be a go-go workshop, okay. um, you know, in celebration of Quentin's film and an autograph signing at Hollywood Autograph, um, which is at the Weston Hotel on the 28th and 29th with a bunch of iconic, you know, television stars and and recording artists. And then I think CBS Sunday Morning is doing a nice little article on me. And Congratulations. I'm really, really excited about that. I'm sure that the that the Quentin film has helped that. And uh, Ayanna Lay is going to do a great article the day before the show premieres um, with all interviews with all the people that were behind the scenes on, on Quentin's film. And I have a T-shirt line that you can go to TonyBasil.net merchandise and check out the Hey Mickey T-shirts and the Locking T-shirts and all of that. And I have a... Uh, court case coming up August 14th uh, to get my master's back. Hmm. Oh, yes. Good luck with that. Yes, thank you. And I will keep you informed. Hmm. Well, there it is. And I have a new Mickey. A Hey Mickey coming out um, July 4th. Just in case I don't win <laughs> my master's case? back. So what, you're doing a sound-alike? Uh, it's not a sound-alike. It's a re-recording. A sound-alike is somebody that wasn't the person. I was the person. Okay. <laughs> so I'm re-recording my song. It sounds exactly like the original. I even used one of the original cheerleaders on the chant, because I'm still in touch with those people. I recorded it exactly oh, the, the same way. Vocals, you mean? Yeah, for the okay. doom, 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 right. doom. yeah, because that that's a whole record in itself, mm -hmm. and that we're will be out on all digital. But you have to go to Hey Mickey Tony Basil because there's a lot of imitations. That is true. Well, there it is, y'all. Tony Basil is here on the Soren Baker Show. We appreciate it tremendously. Oh, I love you back. know I love doing this. Yeah. Thank you so much. Well, thank you and uh, congratulations on all your accomplishments and the fact that you've lived a phenomenal life and had an amazing career that's continuing strong today. To be continued. As robust as ever. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's the Soren Baker Show here on Unique Access and the Digital Soapbox Network. 
Thank you for tuning in this week, and we'll catch you guys next week.